Hey there, happy day before Thanksgiving. Today's lecture is going to be on balance of momentum, specifically linear and angular momentum. <clears throat> so that'll be about the first half or so of the chapter on the same in the textbook. I think that's chapter 19. So let's get started. We'll have a couple relatively quick lectures on the remaining mechanics topics. I'll probably finish them up, uh, you know, between now and this weekend. And then I'm hoping to get through thermo the following week to give us, uh, you know, a week or two of this semester to do some of the constitutive <coughs> theory stuff. All right, so in addition to mass balance, which we introduced last lecture, so one of the sort of postulates of continuum mechanics is that mass is a conserved quantity. <clears throat> um, then a another postulate that we're going to have is that momentum is a conserved quantity. Now, actually, both of those, you can show that they're not postulates. The real postulates are that the laws of physics have to be translation invariant and time invariant, and that... Uh, gives us correspondence between material symmetries and conservation laws. <clears throat> but that's too much fancy math. So we're just going to say that mass is conserved and time rates of change of linear and angular momentum are balanced by net force and net moment, respectively. So for any spatial region P sub T convecting with the body, um, and in some of the upcoming stuff, I might not put the T under it, but if it's a scripty P, know that it convects with the body. Well, first we have the net force on P is balanced by temporal changes in the linear momentum of P. And second is that the net external moment is balanced by temporal changes in the angular momentum. <clears throat>
All right, so we can now <clears throat> define the linear and angular momentum as integrals over p, like this, the linear momentum. Well, that is, we'll denote it as a vector L, which is a function of spatial region. <clears throat> and it is defined as the integral over that spatial region of the mass density times the velocity. Defining the origin of our inertial reference frame. O with <coughs> R equal to x minus O. Then the angular momentum is going to look like this. And so the textbook, and therefore us, denotes that as vector A of that region is defined as the integral over that region of R cross the momentum density dV. All right, so I'd mentioned that we're using an inertial frame of reference for all of our <clears throat> laws, right? That's one where there is no frame acceleration or frame rotation. Um, now, if you talk to relativistic physics people or whatever, there's always, you know, what is a, an inertial reference frame sort of question. But um, in classical mechanics, we don't really have to worry about it so much. <clears throat> and um, we're, we're going to do all of our stuff within an inertial reference frame. There's a little bit in chapter 20 or so where we talk about how things have to transform if you, you know, are looking at it from an accelerated reference frame. Um, but basically, the way that you do continuum mechanics in an accelerated reference frame, so a non-inertial one, is to develop everything in an inertial reference frame and then apply coordinate transforms to it rather than <clears throat> try to develop everything in some weird ad hoc way in non-inertial frames. So we'll get to that in a couple lectures. We'll go through that relatively quickly. All right, well, we're going to look at taking the time derivatives of the linear and angular momentum of that region. So first, <clears throat> we have that um, the time derivative of r is equal to x dot minus the time derivative of the origin. <clears throat> These are the material time derivatives. Um, well, I guess not with the origin part, but the origin is just minus the origin. Um, the time derivative of the origin in our reference frame is always going to be 0, though it might not correspond to a fixed material point. So this is equal to the velocity. So if we look at the time derivative of r cross v, that is equal to r cross v dot plus 
r dot <coughs> cross v. which is equal to r cross v dot plus v cross v. That's 0, so this is equal to r cross v dot. All right, so that's going to be useful for our um, time derivative of the angular momentum. So now let's write out the time derivatives of l and a. <clears throat> and so these are time derivatives following the material. You know, this is the time derivative if P sub T is a region convecting with the body. That is equal to the integral P of T rho v d v whole thing dot we had the section on the balance of mass and the reynolds transport theorem and everything gave us that is equal to the integral over the same of now just rho v dot dv <coughs> and the time derivative of the angular momentum is equal to the time derivative of this whole mess. And that is equal to the integral over P of R cross rho V dot. <coughs> dv. All right, so we said that the time rates of change of linear and angular momentum are going to balance the net external forces on p sub t and the net external moment. Well, there are two types of forces that can act on p. There are surface forces and body forces. So surface forces are things that happen, you know, on a surface, like per unit area. And body forces are things that happen over the whole volume, so like gravity. Surface forces are more complicated, so we'll start with those. Okay, so let's imagine <clears throat> that we have our spatial region convecting with the body, and we slice it by some surface into two halves that we'll call minus and plus. So here is our spatial region P sub T convecting with the body. So here <coughs> is our spatial region P sub T that convects with the body. <coughs> here is S sub T. 
a surface that splits P into half. Well, not half, but two parts that share only S in common. So we'll have P minus sub T and <coughs> P plus sub T. All right. Let's say that we have a point x here in that surface separating the two. <coughs> and it has unit normal, which we're saying this unit normal points from negative to positive. So we'll call it n minus of x and t. Well, there's another unit normal that goes in the opposite direction, which points out from the plus side. We'll call that n plus of x and t. All right, well, there, you know, p minus here can exert through this surface a force on p plus. And so p plus is going to have to exert the equal and opposite force on <clears throat> p minus for Newton's you know, law of equal and opposite reaction to hold. Um, so, so we imagine then that, where do we have it? Oh, I didn't draw it here. All right, so maybe let's move some stuff here. Ooh, new idea. Let's zoom in real good. All right, so let's say we're... Gonna zoom in down here on that. Be really cool if I could like grab that and copy it and scale it up, but we know that's not gonna happen, so we'll just do it again down here. So we have our point X on the surface, you know, and so here's P, whoopsies. Yeah, so let's say that we're just looking at the P minus side of things. And there's X. Um, well, we could have, say, T minus of X. <clears throat> And T is the force that P plus is exerting on P minus. So again, we have <clears throat> so P plus here is like the uh, you know, the X that the family carefully cropped out of the photo or something. All right, so P minus is exerting on P plus this local surface traction density. Right, so this would be like force per unit area. And it has to be equal and opposite. like that, where <clears throat> this point here is x in st. All right, so let's kind of write that.
Peace. And then n hat minus is outward <coughs> from p minus, and n hat plus is out from n plus. <coughs> All right, so we're going to show a lot of stuff about how T has to behave. Uh, so Koshi, who really got around in terms of coming up with continuum mechanics and all sorts of other science theories, uh, he's one of the big ones in figuring out how surface forces have to go. Koshi hypothesized that the local force, the local surface force in a material, um, density between two material regions at a given point, it should depend only on the normal direction to the surface separating those two regions and not on higher order surface shape effects. So let's look at a little 2D example. So in this 2D example, we're going to look at dividing P sub T two different ways. All right, so here's our 2D P. <clears throat> well, one thing that we could do, we could have this surface divide it. Let's say that our point of interest is right here. Well, we could also divide it. It's important that these be tangent at that point. All right, so we have four regions here. There's the left side of the orange curve and the right side of the orange curve the left side of the blue curve, and the right side of the blue curve. So let's put this point here is x.
And then there is, we'll say, N1, and then N2 will be the opposite of that. And so these are the unit normals to both surfaces. Maybe we'll call this surface um, O, T, and this one S. We give them a little sub T, <coughs> sub T. And so maybe we'll call the left surface of S sub T a t minus and a t plus and over here is b t minus not to be confused with b the body just b a you know sub <coughs> region of p no, not transpose, plus. All right, so, so what we're saying, and what would seem to make sense, um, is that at the point x, you know, the, the force, the surface force, you know, exerted right here by b plus on b minus, Cauchy hypothesizes that that should be equal to the local you know, surface force, so density, like per unit area, exerted by A plus on A minus, <clears throat> which is to say that at a given point, the, um, the surface force should be a function only of N and not of, say, curvature effects. So if that's the case, then you know, this implies the existence of a surface traction field, which is the surface force density T as a smooth function of the direction N, your location X, and time T. <clears throat> All right, so Cauchy's hot. Ooh, let's make it. Oopsies. And so what we'd have is, um, so that in the above, the force per unit area of a t plus on a t minus at x is <coughs> t and minus oh here we have n1 which is n minus in our kind of previous example which is also equal to the force of b sub t plus on b sub t minus
where you know the surfaces separating the two are tangent. <clears throat> and then likewise the um, the force of a minus t on a plus t is equal to t. Now it is n two x and t n two is equal to minus n one. All right, so it's going to be the case that t of minus n one has to equal minus t of n one. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit here. In fact, we'll get to that in the next lecture, really. But that's you know Newton's law <clears throat> requiring equal and opposite reaction. All right, so. From our previous 3D example up here, the total force exerted by P plus on P minus goes like this. We'll say total surface force. So it is the integral over that surface of T of n hat, where n hat is the outward unit normal from p minus. That's a function of x <coughs> and t. And then the traction field t is a function of position and also time, dA. And for you know sake of notational brevity, we'll let the x and t stuff be implied. So it'll just be t of n dA. So the integral ST, TN, dA. All right, the force exerted on P plus by P minus is like this. That's going to be integral again over s. And again, it's t, but now of minus n, because that's the outward normal from p plus dA. <clears throat> All right, so it's going to be the case that this is true. Um, and you can probably get, well, in fact, you can see that pretty immediately from here just by thinking about the equilibrium of that surface that doesn't have any mass of its own. Um, but we'll show that in a little bit here, in fact, in the next lecture, as part of a much stronger result talking about the nature of the surface traction field.
All right, so first let's go to the body force, um, and that's going to be simple enough. <clears throat> Let me rearrange my papers here before I have an avalanche. All right, so the force per unit volume exerted on this region PT by external body forces, so like gravity, is called the conventional body force, and we're going to denote it lowercase b sub zero. So it's noted B sub zero, and it's a vector field. <clears throat> All right, so the balance of linear momentum can be written like this. So it is um, the time derivative of L, the linear momentum of PT, is equal to F PT with <clears throat> L dot equaling what we showed. And with F, the net external force, equaling the integral over the surface of the surface traction acting on the outward normal, plus the integral over the volume of the conventional body force integrated over the volume. And then in a similar fashion, we can write out the balance of angular momentum. Why did it do that? You know, the whole point of these like digital stylus things is they don't get all jammed up with like dried up ink or anything, and yet here we are. All right, so A dot <clears throat> of PT is equal to M PT, where A dot is equal to the integral over P of R cross rho V dot dV and M, the net external moment, is equal to the integral over the surface of the moment of the surface traction force plus, that was an ugly integral, 
the integral not over the boundary over the whole body of the moment due to the conventional body force. Right, and so if you have a conservative body force, this will always end up being zero. Um, and you note that we're not talking about having moments due to, say, a moment per unit volume. We have moments due to forces, but not like couples, um, you know, like you would have in beam theory or something. That's consistent with three-dimensional continuum mechanics. Um, couples really come from, well, that's a funny one right there. <laughs> you know, physics couples, they, they come from uh, trying to take a three-dimensional case like the force distribution over the end of a beam and uh, collapsing it to 1D. And then you end up with couples or, you know, pure moments. All right, so for notational brevity, the book combines the conventional body force and the time derivative of momentum locally called the inertial force or the D'Ambert force, which I'll write out for you. <clears throat> and they combine that into a single vector field B called the generalized body force. <laughs> Um, I haven't seen a whole, well, it's useful to do it, but it's not like, I've seen plenty of people who don't. It doesn't really buy you much, but when you see B instead of B naught in the book, just recall in the back of your head like, oh man, that includes the uh, time derivative of momentum in it. Otherwise, that can get you a little thrown off. That's not going to write. So the inertial force is vector i is equal to minus rho v dot, um, also called the d a l m b e r t force into a single vector field. B is equal to B naught plus I is equal to B naught minus rho V dot called the generalized body force. And like, I'm going to be honest, I'm not really a huge fan of it because while it does simplify the notation a little bit, you know, you have a few less terms to write out. Um, it's like giving you a little bit of notational convenience for a pretty high increased risk of shooting yourself in the foot. Um, and I don't really like shooting myself in the foot. So, you know, if I were writing the book, I'd probably leave it here, but we'll try to do it the book's way. Um, and just always remember when you see that, that that has the inertial stuff in it. All right, so in this case, the balance of linear and angular momentum operators, which give you the imbalance 
um, they're going to be vector operators of P. And we're going to make them, they're also going to be F and M of P per the book's notation. Uh, the book was written using LaTeX, so they used the slash math frac, like F-R-A-K, which is fractor, um, to get nice angly looking ones. We're just going to draw them real carefully here. So note that the F and P, or rather F and M that I am drawing now are the linear and angular momentum imbalance operators. And so the conservation law would be that these two operators are zero. Um, whereas previously the not fancy looking F and M, the net external force and moment, uh, were just the net external force and moment. All right, so here we go. So this is like a uh, my best effort at a fractor-faced F. So that is different from the other F, F sub P. So we're not going to write the sub T here, but this is a spatial region that convects with the body, which would have normally been P sub T. But they stopped putting the sub T in the book, so I'll stop putting it here in my notes, uh, but know that it that's what we're talking about. So this linear momentum operator is defined as the sum over, or rather the integral, over the boundary of the surface traction plus the integral over the body of the generalized body force, which includes the inertia, <laughs> dv. And balance of linear momentum implies that this has to equal vector zero for any spatial region P convecting with the body. Get out of the way there. All right, and then our angular momentum balance operator is going to be And that's going to look pretty similar. Integral over the boundary <coughs> of the moment due to the surface traction plus the integral over the body of the moment of the generalized body force dv is equal to vector zero. All right, the next section in the book I would call a prelude to the principle of virtual power. It's kind of a, a special case of it before we prove Cauchy's theorem about the existence of a stress tensor field and uh, restricting the principle to rigid velocity fields, but it's going to turn out to be useful anyway. And we're going to use this in um, the next lesson to prove that the Cauchy stress is symmetric. But we'll just start out here with it. Oh, yeah, let's capitalize it because it's important. And we'll kind of call that principle of virtual power PVP. Um, <clears throat> this is the same thing as the principle of virtual work, if you'll recall that. But it's more technically correct 
to think of it in terms of a rate of work done by a velocity than it is to think of it as the infinitesimal work done by an infinitesimal displacement. Um, the reason being when you go to configuration spaces that aren't vector spaces, then the tangent space to them doesn't look like the configuration space. Um, and the one of the simplest examples of this, well, heck, actually, a uh, six body dynamic, or the six degree of freedom, like rigid motion, the rotational part of them is, you know, a, a good example where your infinitesimal rotations look like a vector, you know, a, a, an angular velocity, but your finite rotations do not. Um, so that's really why it makes more sense to talk about the principle of virtual power rather than the principle of virtual work, um, even though it is the same concept. All right, so enough of that rambling on about that. You won't care until you run into a need for the distinction. You'll be like, oh yeah, that's what he was talking about. Or you'll never run into a need for the distinction and just go the rest of your life thinking I was a loony, which would be all right too. So given any rigid velocity field, which we call W of X and T, <clears throat> which is equal to some vector alpha, which is a function only of time. So that would be like your translation part of the velocity plus another vector that is a function only of time cross R, where R is equals x minus our origin. Let's move that over into the, yeah. So that second part is our rotation. Then we're going to define the, I'll put in parentheses, virtual power <coughs> expended on P over the velocity field W as follows. All right, so that's going to be W R I G for rigid of P and W <coughs> is defined as the integral over the boundary of the work done by the surface traction. Plus the integral over the volume of the work done by the generalized, so including the inertia, body force. All right, so the reason, well, another reason that I think it makes more sense to think about the virtual power done by a, say, virtual, so pretend, velocity field, um, as opposed to by a pretend displacement, for instance, is that it makes it clear that the virtual displacement or virtual velocity field is not messing with the state. And what I mean by that is like when we go to get constitutive laws, um, there's room for leading yourself astray because if you think about a, 
displacement of the state from the current state, it's like, well, wouldn't there also be a change in stress? And so you get like this, uh, you know, K delta X squared sort of thing, or one half K delta X squared thing for springs instead of the just force that it currently has times your virtual displacement. <clears throat> well, when you talk about velocities, then that uh, you get to the right thing, um, which if you realize that virtual means you're not messing with the actual state for the other way, then it also works. But I think this one leaves less room for going badly astray. All right, so we have a nice functional form for W, so these integrals are gonna work out pretty nice. So b dot w anywhere is equal to b dot alpha plus lambda cross r. All right, well, that is equal to alpha dot b plus we use our vector triple product moving things around identity lambda dot r cross b and we have that um t n hat dot w is equal to alpha t n plus lambda dot r cross t n. All right, so then the virtual work by this rigid velocity field is going to look like this. That is equal to the integral over the boundary of alpha dot t n plus lambda dot r cross t of n all integrated over the area <coughs> plus the integral over the volume of alpha dot b plus lambda dot r cross b dv. All right, well, we know that alpha and lambda are constant with space. You know, they vary with time, but not with space. So we can factor them out of the integrals there. And that is equal to alpha dot the integral over the boundary of t of n, the surface traction, dA plus the integral over the volume, of b dv plus lambda dot the integral over the boundary <coughs> of the moment due to the surface traction plus the integral over the volume of R cross generalized body force All right, well, if we look here, this is the balance of linear 
momentum, so that has to be 0. And this is the balance of angular momentum, so that has to be 0. So that is equal to alpha dot, our fancy f, the balance operator. plus lambda dot <coughs> the angular momentum balance operator. So the following three are equivalent. It's really the following two since the first two are identical. First is the virtual work done by any rigid motion is zero. Well, power for all rigid velocity fields. <clears throat> the second is the same thing. Is equal to zero for all vectors alpha and lambda. So, you know, vectors that don't vary with space. So same as the first one, since they define a rigid motion. Ugh. And finally, the balance of linear and angular momentum are satisfied on P. So if the virtual work of any rigid motion is zero for every rigid motion, then we know that balance of linear and angular momentum are satisfied. And if balance of linear and angular momentum are satisfied, we know that the virtual work of all rigid motions have to be zero. Virtual power, excuse me. So fancy F. So as the book says, the power expended over every rigid velocity field W vanishes if and only if the force and moment balances are satisfied. All right, that's it for that. Next lecture is going to be on <clears throat> the proof of Cauchy's theorem. It's probably the most mathy proofy thing that we're going to do for the entire rest of the class. It's a bit of a tedious proof. Um, it's an important thing to work through once, and the same exact argument is going to apply to the existence of a heat flux vector. Um, we'll let you guys show that one later since it'll be easier. Um, yeah, so we'll probably do that later today. It won't be too bad. Um, probably for the rest of the semester we'll be doing shorter lectures.
of little topics now that we have little topics to break it into. Um, I apologize if there's going to be probably like a good chunk of lectures for the remainder of the this semester. We're a little behind where I want to be, but um, you know the the homeworks. I think while we're going to have more lectures, um, the the homeworks probably won't be quite as nasty. Um, I'll make sure to have them not be so calculation intensive so that you can try to get through and understand the lectures. All right, have a good one. Catch you later.